Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested, and today I'm joined by Alex Hornstein, who's CTO of a company called Looking Glass Factory. Now we met you guys at Maker Faire a couple years ago when you were showing off a product called the L3D Cube. Right, it was a, a grid of, or like a matrix of LEDs. Um, and you have a new product, what is this that you've brought here today? Yeah, so this is volume, and this is a new type of volumetric display. So uh, the earlier product you saw, the L3D Cube, is a low-res volumetric display. It only has 512 points of light. And this one is really a, a quantum leap forward. This has 2 million points of light. And this, instead of just showing abstract things, this is showing video. This can show people, if I saw, if I saw uh, Jane or Ben here, I would recognize them if I saw them later on the street. Yeah, so I remember with L3D Cube, even when you packed in 512 points of light, uh, it didn't really qualify as a, like a display. It, uh -huh. it was like these arranged, beautiful arrangements of colors, RGB LEDs, you know, whether four by four, eight by eight by eight. Uh, and but at some point, I remember chatting with you and saying, "What's the next step for this? How at some point do you get enough pixels to be able to resolve real images and not just two D images, three D images?" Uh, so how does volume work? Because I can see as it's playing right now uh, a video, but it has dimensionality to it. That's right. Yeah. So the whole trick with volume is getting more and more points of light into here. And we did that using a Pico projector. So in the base here, we have the guts of a Pico projector. And that's shining up into this projection head. And the projection head is just a specially engineered piece of plastic that breaks uh, the projected video down into 10 different slices, each one mm. spaced out uh, throughout, like, throughout this head. And we read that as 10 screens stacked up. Ah, so when you say about 2 million points of light, 2 million volumetric pixels, it's basically taking like a 1080p, 1920 by 1080 projection, a 2D image, slicing those up, and then putting them at maybe a slight angle across 10 different planes, which when combined, you get the image. How did you, get, you guys to get to, yeah, well, I, you guys told me this beforehand. <laughs> I kind of can see what's going on, but how did you get to 10 planes? Because there's a lot of ways to divide up you know, a 1080p image. Sure. So uh, there's a finite number of pixels in here. You can put more planes in, you get lower resolution. You can put fewer planes in, you get more resolution. And uh, in many ways, it was, it was qualitative. We did this with simulations. First of all, we would try all these different uh, combinations of higher resolution, but fewer, fewer planes, more planes, less resolution. Um, and we would just say, oh, well, this this starts to look good. We knew what the budget was that we could afford for a projector, um, that we would make this overall unit affordable. And we said, well, let's make the best looking uh, display we can get. And 10 slices was, was where we ended up. And a lot of it also is with this, the plastic and the arrangement, because you want for it to be a, a working volumetric display, you, you'll, you need to see through it. That's and right. it's kind of an evolution of a product you guys used to make. These guys right here, right, which were these prints that were volumetric images, but essentially the same idea, like layers? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so these are what we dream of a volumetric display looking like. This is one frame of a volumetric video. So in this one, or in this one with, uh, this is a 3D scan of Sean, our CEO, and uh, these have really good resolution, and all this is drawn on 70 slices with a bunch of points of ink. Mm. and turning that into dynamic video is replacing all those points of ink with pixels, with points of light. Uh, and so as we move towards higher and higher resolution displays, it just means getting slices closer together and getting more pixels onto those slices. Right, a higher res resolution projector, more slices, a denser image. Now you talked about these being 3D scanned objects. So my next question is how do you get imagery on here? Um, you have a process video here, which I can tell when you're plugging it from like a, a tablet, mm -hmm. which that you're converting a 2D image into a 3D image, but how do you get, even capture that 2D image? Sure. Um, so this one was captured on an iPad uh, using a, uh, a structure sensor. So this is uh, a sensor with the same guts as the Kinect. Mm -hmm. um, and it's built by a company just down the street from here called Occipital. Um, it plugs into an iPad or an iPhone. Um, and we built an app for it that lets us capture, this is really the first app that lets us just point and shoot, capture volumetric video. Mm. And the process is just like shooting normal video with the phone. You don't, uh, there's a record button you hit and then you can trim and edit video later on. 
um, and you play it back and it shows up in volume. Now you gotta imagine it's in your best interest. This is a developer kit for people, your users, to be generating content, experimenting with what it means to film video, design, and create things in 3D, in real 3D space, um, there are a lot of consumer tools that now can do depth sensing, right? Mm -hmm. Intel's cameras, the RealSense cameras, even the new you know, iPhone 7 Plus has two cameras. Yeah. Are you guys gonna be building those tools using their API so people can capture 3D video? In a word, yes. Uh, so there's tons of different cameras out there. There's more coming up all the time. Uh, there's about 37 million depth sensing cameras out in the world in consumer devices right now. And the way we see, uh, ourselves fitting into this is we want to add software uh, through things like the iPad app that we built. We want to extend that to work with a larger and larger variety of phones, of tablets, of, of different sensors, so that more and more people have access to being able to capture 3D video and work with it. Well, in addition to video, you can also display, I believe, objects, 3D models in here. Uh, is there another demo we can check out? This shows one of the things you guys made. Yeah, let's look at one of the interactive video game demos. Alex, what are we looking at here? Uh, so this is actually a demo that was built by Leap Motion, and it lets us use the Leap sensor, this guy right here, uh, to capture hands and interact with something in this 3D world in volume. All right, so uh, let's get a demo of that. I know you guys have Sean, your CEO, uh, who's gonna run the demo for us. Um, so what happens when you have interactivity? Because uh, as Sean moves in and puts his hands over Leap Motion, so, Oh, We're seeing his hands. There's his hands. Right. Um, can, I, can I get a high five? <laughs> uh, so his hands are in there, um, and every cue he has about moving around in the physical world is still there. He moves his hands forwards. He moves them around. He can interact with that flower with these virtual hands that he sees. Um, and this is like one of many ways but, that you can interact with volume, but it's one we think is most intuitive and most direct. You just use this tool we have built in. We know how to work with our hands. I mean, I can buy Leap Motion and get their SDK and view this on my standard computer screen, my laptop screen, That's or right. I can, you know, put on a VR goggles. What do you feel like is the advantage of having being in, in the same environment, real world environment, as the volumetric display in this? So one, one that's an awesome question. So one of them, one advantage is if you're wearing VR goggles, we don't get to see your world. You can create, you can draw, you can explore in this world, but we're all shut out of it because we don't have those goggles mm. and. Here, Sean is uh, doing these intricate interactions in virtual space, and we're all experiencing like it's uh, like it's right here because volume brings that into our world. Um, and then it also lets us use the depth cues, the things that are built into our brains. Like if I want to look at this from an angle, I just move, um, and I can I can see things from different angles because this is really just in three D. It's like there's a flower in front of me. Mm. And so I imagine you'll be working with developers to make. Uh, both content, like games, entertainment, you know, playing something, a video game from two sides, uh, or development tools. Like, what, what has happened when you put this in front of modelers, 3D modelers? Yeah, um, so that's really neat. Uh, so we've done a lot of work with video game creators, 3D modelers, and animators, and uh, one of the things I love is being able to look at stuff people have already created. So let's say someone made an animation loop for a video game and they pull it into Unity, which is where about 50% of the world's video games are built in this programming environment. And we built an SDK for Unity that looks like a cube. And you drop it over somebody's animation or their game, and whatever's inside the cube shows up in here. And uh, so for the vast majority of existing content, it's as simple as that. You drop this in, and what you built shows up here. Uh, and then making it, making tweaking interactions to make them feel satisfying and interesting and engaging in here it may take extra work, but just getting it in is actually really straightforward. Yeah, I love that it's just, it's a new mode of interacting with your content that you can describe it, but until you actually get in front of it and uh -huh. actually interact with it, it's really tough to describe. Um, so where, what's the status of volume? You guys are launching a pre-order campaign for this? Yeah, we're launching on Wednesday, uh, and we're launching a pre-order campaign. 
Uh, and we're really stoked to see as this gets out, these are these first volumes are really developers' kits. We want to see what creators are going to do with them. We want to see what the types of things people will create, and we want to work with people to facilitate and expand the types of stuff they can get into here and types of experiences they can make with it. And as you'll be refining the hardware for something that's more consumer-facing, how do you envision that process to be? What, what can a consumer version of volume look like? Yeah, sure. So we think a consumer version, uh, and this is a few years out, but we think a consumer version would have like twice the number of slices, twice the resolution. It would be visible from more sides. And uh, we also will want to bundle in. It's, this device is more like a display. You have a computer outside of it and you plug in. And we think a consumer version needs to be more integrated. It has to have this, uh, that's, you have to be able to go and look at different content or videos or apps that people have made and be able to, to browse through them and find them and, and play and work with them uh, just all in this device. Very cool. Can't wait to see what you guys come up with next. It really is an incredible thing. It feels very futuristic and it, it's very convincing. Thank you so much, yeah. Alex, for bringing the volume prototype here. And thank you, Sean, for running that demo. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you.